The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. The magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey! It's a segment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. It's Friday, you bastards. FBI agents have issued at least one federal subpoena for Ow! records from the Texas Attorney General's office in an ongoing investigation into allegations against Attorney General Ken Paxton here in the state of Texas. Sources confirmed to senior reporter Tony Plahetsky that the requests for information were issued Wednesday at the agency's headquarters on West 14th Street. Tony joins us now live from our newsroom with more. Tony. And Brian, it is unclear how many of those subpoenas were issued or what information those federal agents are looking for. The investigation started after top Paxton aides alleged to the FBI in early October that they believe Paxton may be committing crimes that include abuse of office and bribery in his dealings with Austin investor Nate Paul. The group claimed that Paxton took a number of steps to benefit Paul. Paul's offices were raided by the FBI last year. Those steps included hiring an outside investigator to investigate Paul's assertion that the FBI violated his constitutional rights during the raid. Paxton denies any wrongdoing. Ah. In recent weeks, FBI agents have been questioning people who may have information about Paxton's relationship with Paul, but the FBI, we should point out, has not publicly confirmed any investigation. Right. Today, a spokeswoman for the FBI said she could not comment, and a spokesman for the Attorney General's office did not return our calls. Earlier today, Paxton was in Washington, D.C. He joined about a dozen other AGs from a across the nation in a meeting with President Trump huh. on a variety of topics. Oh, oh okay. So we have some uh, forward movement in the, um, well, in the discovery of the motivation that uh, Ken Paxton, the Attorney General of Texas, has to put in front of the court a bunch of frivolous, lying, ridiculously twisted um, arguments to overturn 20 million people's votes 20 million people's votes to overturn the will of the people or to get involved in a seditious conspiracy a seditious conspiracy that is what we have here so now what we know is the motive okay the motive to to, to literally betray your country in service to Donald Trump who is an autocratic dictator and wants to be president for life. We knew that Ken Paxton was in legal trouble. We also knew that Ken Paxton was doing just about anything that Donald Trump wanted him to do, including filing the bogus lawsuit against the ACA uh, and combating voting rights in the state of Texas. You know, his crusade to suppress Texas voters is kind of legendary. It's kind of uh, mesmerizing. This man, Ken Paxton, tried to prevent young people in Texas from voting by mail. He then threatened to prosecute Texans who voted absentee uh, due to fear of COVID-19. Then he prevented counties in Texas from sending absentee ballot applications to all registered voters and he prohibited the county, uh, any county, from offering more than one ballot drop box, which we know he was successful in doing, but he unsuccessfully sought to ban drive through voting. We know that there was a split between him and Governor Abbott, right? And we couldn't figure out what the hell was going on in Texas. Well, now we can. Now we know that no state official did more than Ken Paxton to restrict voting to restrict the franchise, okay? It is not surprising that he is asking the Supreme Court to throw out the election in its entirety now. But we didn't really have a motive. We knew that he was under investigation for various things. And we also knew that Ken Paxton has been under indictment for securities fraud, we'll explain, since 2015, but that there was never a trial. Why wasn't there a trial in five years? And how could he be attorney general while he's under indictment? Well, it looks like this man has a very long history of legal trouble. 
And part of it is this. In 2015, a Texas grand jury actually uh, indicted him. They indicted him on charges of felony securities fraud. He allegedly, and we can only say allegedly at this point because there's been no trial, but now we know why there's been no trial. But here's the crime. He asked his friends to buy shares in a company without disclosing that he was getting secret commissions for selling those shares from that company. And he's not a securities broker, but he was receiving commissions as if he were secretly and on the sly. So he paid a fine for doing that, but he's under indictment to this day for doing that. It's a criminal offense, okay? Now, the reason why it's never gone to trial seems to be because he was able to get his friends in government, in Texas government, to literally defund the prosecution, his own prosecution. He was able to defund it by appealing to his friends in government to defund a prosecution against him. His wife, Ken Paxton's wife, he also has mistress, but the wife is a state senator. She also filed legislation that would allow what he did to become a legal enterprise. But it wasn't legal, it isn't legal to this day, and he is under indictment for doing a criminal thing. So when he realized he was under indictment for the criminal thing, he decided he would defund his prosecution and he was successful in defunding it. All right, what is this FBI raid about? Well, this fall, there were several, like eight whistleblowers from Ken Paxton's own office, senior officials in his office. On October 1st, Seven of the senior staff members went to law enforcement and asked that they investigate Ken Paxton for, quote, violating federal and or state law, including prohibitions related to improper influence, abuse of office, bribery, and other criminal offenses. They were led by a really crazy dude. Okay, I got to say, they're all crazy there. I mean, this is like um, this is like the GOP eating its own is, is really what it is. The group was led by a guy named Jeff Mateer. He was the top aide to Paxton, and he has since resigned. Here's his GOP bona fides, the top whistleblower against Paxton, just to give you a clue about how dirty Paxton actually is. Mateer, in 2017, was nominated to the federal bench by Donald Trump. A top aide in Paxton's office was nominated to the federal bench by Donald Trump. He had to withdraw his name from consideration because CNN reported that he had said that transgender children were part of Satan's plan. You may remember his testimony. He said that transgender children are part of Satan's plan. Same-sex marriage is debauchery and is an endorser of conversion therapy. He's the whistleblower against Paxton. He filed for whistleblower protection. Then six others in Paxton's office also filed for whistleblower protection. And in a leaked text message, the news learned that The complaints involved a relationship he had with a bankrupt real estate developer named Nate Paul, who donated $25,000 to Paxton's 2018. Now, (laughs) it gets a little dirty. It gets a little dirtier, you know, if you're uh, sexually confined. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show.
President Trump met behind closed doors Thursday with several Republican state attorneys general. The White House insists the meeting was pre-planned, even though all but two of the officials are backing a lawsuit brought by Texas AG Ken Paxton this week to invalidate the election results in four battleground states. <laughs> to nullify the votes of 20 million people. I, it's just, uh, and, and we may we may have uh, a rejection uh, or an acceptance by the Supreme Court today. I, I have my eye open. Uh, the responses have been filed by all of these states. Uh, 20 other states have joined in asking the Supreme Court to please just kick this to the curb and get this done. Uh, but Ken Paxton was literally in Donald Trump's orifice yesterday. And I mean that. He was in his orifice yesterday, uh, and he was probably begging for some sort of a pardon. Because here, here's the dirty little deal. This is how it started, okay? Okay. Ken Paxton was having an affair. He was having an affair with an aide to a GOP state legislator, okay? Uh, And he acknowledged that he was having an affair, right? He said that he was having an affair with a state senator while his wife was also (laughs) a state senator. Um, But he then encouraged Paul, this guy, this this failed real estate developer, uh, to hire his mistress. What could go wrong? Now, while Paxton has said, yes, I cheated on my wife, uh, you know, but of course he's, uh, you know, holier than thou, right? Do they obey any of the commandments on any day ever, or are they very busy breaking all of them twice a day every day? I don't know. Anyway, so this guy, Nate Paul, hired his mistress. Now, Nate Paul denies that he hired the mistress as a favor or you know that Paxton had asked him to do it they just all know the same the same people okay that's what we're supposed to believe anyway Mr. Paul went bankrupt okay he went bankrupt and it led to lot lots of legal disputes he was stiffing his creditors sound familiar he was stiffing all his creditors and one of the creditors uh, was a foundation a nonprofit foundation that gives grants and scholarships to low-income students the foundation invested with Nate Paul And then they were forced to sue him because he concealed the bad financial information. So Nate Paul turned around and said, I'll buy you out and gave them $10.5 million to settle a a lawsuit and then refused to pay. Sounds like a great guy. And when he refused to pay, he needed help. So he went to Ken Paxton, the Attorney General of Texas, and he said, stop the case. You stopped your case, stop my case. And that's what he did. They Literally, he used his office to stop the case for Nate Paul, a bankrupt real estate dude who stiffed a charitable foundation. And then once the charitable foundation sued him, he agreed to a settlement and refused to pay the settlement and then turned to his friend, the Attorney General of Texas, and asked him to put a stop to the case. And that is exactly what Paxton did. And after he was able to stop the case, just like he was able to stop his own case by defunding the prosecution for his own securities fraud, he did it for his friend who hired his mistress. And shortly after that, he got a $25,000 donation to his reelect campaign in 2018. That is when the people in his office, this crazy dude, Jeff Mateer, this this seriously uh, big hater, okay, who worked for Ken Paxton, filed a whistleblower complaint. On November 17th, the Associated Press had reported that the FBI was now investigating Ken Paxton alongside of Nate Paul, saying that he abused his office to help Nate Paul get out of legal trouble with this not-for-profit. That now is a federal bribery and corruption case. And on Wednesday, the FBI issued subpoenas for Ken Paxton's papers, and now he has no power to defund the prosecutors. 
But instead, he's undermining the credibility of the FBI itself. Now, what's interesting about this is this could not have happened without a sign-off from, Depart- from the Department of Justice, meaning Bill Barr. Meaning Bill Barr. And so that is why Ken Paxton is so um, eager to commit sedition to commit sedition to overturn the will of the American people in a free and fair election that was free of fraud, right? Uh, After he engaged in massive voter suppression in his state to try to deprive his voters of the ability to vote or drop off their ballots at a drop box or vote uh, absentee uh, because he just knew that the more people that showed up, the, the, the more likely it would be that Trump loses. So he engaged in massive voter suppression, and nobody has sued him for massive voter suppression. You know, this is so unbelievable. So I would suggest that if there's any chance that the Supreme Court today says, all right, let's hear it just to clear the air or to give people assurances that this wasn't for, I don't, you know, if they do anything except a very terse one sentence rejection today, right? Then I would suggest New York sue Texas. Do you know what I'm saying? New York or Massachusetts or, you know, uh, file a counterclaim Wisconsin, file a counterclaim Pennsylvania, and, and accuse Texas of what they did for real, and that's voter suppression, okay? Go ahead and file a countersuit saying that they tried to subvert the rule of law and replace it with the rule of Ken Paxton, who is under indictment and is still serving as the Attorney General of Texas, okay? Do it all over the country. I mean, if this is the way we're gonna play, then let's play. New York, let's sue South Carolina. Let's sue South Carolina and say, Lindsey Graham only won re-election through massive voter fraud. Let's sue Kentucky and say, Mitch McConnell is a, you know, uh, I mean, there is no way that Kentuckians with, you know, their, uh, they're like last in education, last in healthcare, last in, uh, you know, uh, uh, the average median income, whatever, you know, sue them and say, Mitch McConnell only won through fraud, right? And, and, and let's just do this thing. No, we don't do this thing, okay? We don't do it. The only reason why you have Ken Paxton doing it is because Ken Paxton has a motive to do it. Ken Paxton will go to jail, just like Donald Trump will go to jail. Now, the rest of the Republicans who, you know, you got almost 64% of the House Republicans as of this minute signing on to an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, saying... They want the Supreme Court to overturn elections that they were elected in. All right, let's have a look, see at that little situation. So you now have House members who were reelected in this same election that they claim was fraudulent. Uh, They should be prohibited from taking the oath of office when the next House convenes because they were elected through fraud, right? Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. After a very, very, very long list of norm-busting, democracy-eroding, generally cruel policies on the Trump administration, I gotta say, I found the lawsuit now supported by nearly 20 states that asked the Supreme Court to throw out the votes of the voters in four other states as unnerving as almost anything I have covered ever, including during this presidency. And that's despite the unlikely chance of it working. Today, the president met with a group of Republican attorneys general who are supporting this frankly undemocratic authoritarian effort by the White House And they did it at the White House, while 106 Republican House members, more than half the Republicans in the caucus, and every single one elected or reelected by voters last month, signed a brief supporting the petition to overrule the votes of millions of voters, to overturn the election result, to install the loser in power, Mm. destroy American popular sovereignty, and plunge the country immediately into the worst existential crisis since secession. Seriously, dude, that that is where we are. And, you know, the Democrats have had just about enough of this. 
I will tell you that uh, the member of the House uh, from New Jersey named Bill Pascrell, you may know him, uh, he, he is now demanding, and he's right to demand this, that the 126 members now of the Republican caucus in the House who have signed on to this seditious conspiracy, okay, that they not be permitted to be seated in the new Congress. First of all, they were elected on the same ballot that Donald Trump was elected on. And if you're gonna throw out 20 million votes, then you have to throw out all their votes too. Second, anybody, this is his statement, men and women who would act to tear the United States government apart cannot serve as members of the Congress. Do you agree? I agree. Any member who refuses, refuses the will of the people through lawful elections, and this was a lawful election free of fraud, should not be allowed to be sworn in because their oath requires that they uphold the Constitution and the laws of this nation. And they cannot do that with a straight face. His statement continues, these lawsuits seeking to obliterate public confidence in our democratic system by invalidating the clear results of the 2020 presidential election undoubtedly attack the text and the spirit of the Constitution with each, which each member swears to support and defend. Consequently, I call on you to exercise the power of your offices to evaluate steps you can take to address these constitutional violations. This Congress, if possible, refuse to seat in the 117th Congress any members elect seeking to make Donald Trump an unelected dictator. It's a tweet. That's why I'm reading it off my computer. I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree, and I also think that every state that is being sued needs to file a counterclaim against Texas, saying that their attorney general is under indictment, that the uh, FBI has just issued subpoenas for the attorney general's uh, papers and things uh, because the attorney general is allegedly abusing his office and continues to abuse his office and that there are eight whistleblowers in his office who are just wackadoodles, but they're there and they sought whistleblower protection in order to blow the whistle on Ken Paxton's unlawful behavior using his office as attorney general of Texas. Vote nullification, this is what they're all about here. This is crazy, this is, and, and you know what? Nick Ackerman, he thinks like me. Okay, he really does. Nick Ackerman is a really good attorney, uh, federal attorney. And uh, he, he's actually said what I've been saying forever, that this is racketeering. This is a conspiracy, but it's a conspiracy to commit sedition. They crossed the line. I mean, clearly the lawyers didn't go in and argue issues. They didn't go in and argue a case that was based on fact. They went in and just spewed falsehoods. And they're doing it before the Supreme Court now. I mean, you take one of the worst examples is, is they're trying to say that there was some kind of fraud because on election night, Trump was winning. And then afterwards, he suddenly lost. When in fact, Donald Trump had purposely gotten the legislatures in both Michigan and Pennsylvania to make the law so that you could not count absentee ballots prior to election day. So of course that was gonna happen, but that was a premeditated plot that was orchestrated by Donald Trump from the White House uh, purposely for that reason, to make it appear that somehow these votes came out of nowhere. I mean, that so, really Nick, borders- before I, before I bring yeah. Paul, Paul in, what kind of sanction uh, and against who would you would you want to pursue here? 
Um, I would pursue sanctions against the lawyers. I'd pursue sanctions against the client, Donald yep. Trump. Yep. Uh, they should be paying for the court time, paying for the other lawyers. And I'd look for criminal sanctions. I mean, I think if you take this right back to what the whole goal here was, which was to keep Joe Biden from becoming president, they are involved in bribery extortion with President Zelensky that right. carried right in through a premeditated plan to steal the election from Joe Biden. That was the goal of their entire scheme. And I think there's probably a viable racketeering count that could be hmm. brought against the people involved, including Donald Trump. Oh! Yes, that is what's going on here. It's a racketeering uh, operation. It is a a RICO violation that in, and, and the violation is against the United States of America. It, it's against the Constitution, which makes it sedition. And since you have all these people, all these people who are willing, willing to not uphold the law of the United States of America to the default of, you know, to to to, to the benefit of uh, Donald Trump, to violate the law and argue bullcrap in front of the Supreme Court of the United States to prevent or hinder or delay the execution of the election laws in these United States, they are involved in a conspiracy to commit sedition. And the Trump administration is a racketeering, influenced, corrupt, for lack of a better word, company. No, 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 you cannot, you cannot let this happen, this kind of thing happen in these United States. I have talked to uh, more crazy people in, in my personal life, uh, you know, and they, I swear to God, they believe that it was stolen. They believe Donald Trump is, uh, you know, the president. They believe that something, uh, you know, happened in Michigan. Something happened in Pennsylvania. Something happened in Georgia. Something happened in Wisconsin. That was illegal. And there is no evidence. But they believe it because the president is saying it. Tality. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. All right, if you're following uh, this Supreme Court case, then you obviously are following a an election attorney named uh, Mark Elias. Mark Elias has been doing yeoman's work answering all of these complaints uh, in the states, all right? And uh, he... he is finally giving interviews now uh, with just, you know, 40 days until January 20th, explaining why this is so disgusting, just exactly what this is, that this is an attempted coup, and that's what we are watching. And there's no question that the President of the United States is trying to nullify the votes of 20 million Americans by going to the Supreme Court with this utter nonsense backed by people with obvious motivation to do his bidding to do it so here's mark elias you tweeted earlier that you were shaken by the supreme court lawsuit why'd you say that yeah so let me start by saying i'm not shaken because i think it has any chance of success right. this lawsuit's going to fail just like all the other lawsuits have failed so i'm not worried about that what shook me was that you know when when texas filed this case it was kind of like all right, Paxton is aiming for a pardon or is doing some sort of wacky thing, but this is not going anywhere. But then to see all of these states sign on and 100 plus members of Congress, Republicans, sign on and support this shook me because what it speaks to is an erosion of our democracy going forward. I mean, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are going to be sworn in, but it speaks to an erosion of our democracy going forward that Trumpism and its corrosive effect on democracy and democratic norms has now so thoroughly infected the Republican Party that 18 attorneys general used official resources of states to endorse this cockamamie theory, and that 103 members of Congress, many of whom were elected in these states, yeah. signed on to this. So that's what that's what shook me. 
Yeah, it's shaking. It, it, it will shake you to your core if you're a patriot. It will shake you to your core if you actually, you know, believe in things like um, the Constitution, American democracy with a small d, uh, you know, free and fair elections, uh, you know. Uh, if you believe in those things, then it shakes you to the core that you have this many members of the GOP engaged in a seditious act, engage in a coup, an actually attempted coup to put the loser of the last election into power yet again, and that they don't have any hypocrisy or shame or any reaction to the fact that they were on those ballots too and that they think that they should be sworn in in the 117th congress even though they're alleging that their own elections were fraudulent i mean it's so easily seen as a scam it's worth pointing out i think there's about 12 to 14 republican members from the four states whose votes they are asking to throw out right who are elected by those voters and those votes right yeah, and look, I you know I was very public when uh, Mike Kelly brought his lawsuit in Pennsylvania, um, trying a congressman to throw out the votes there. I questioned whether or not um, Mike Kelly should be sworn in right. uh, as part of the new Congress because if he doesn't think his election was legitimate uh, and things should be thrown out, then I think the House Administration Committee should look at that prior to him being sworn in. And I and I, I you know I, at the time that seemed like an outlier position for one member of Congress to take. But boy, to see 103 members of Congress oh, take this position now. and a dozen from these states, there is something fundamentally wrong with the Republican Party. There is no Republican Party. There is no Republican Party. There's only, uh, the, 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 there's only Trumpism, which is autocratic dictatorship. There is, it's fascism. There is no, no Republican Party. Period. Period. Uh, Nicholas in New Mexico. In Cristobal, Mexico, Randy. How are you? Hi. It's been a very long time since I've spoken with you. I never have time anymore. I mod over at Tom Hartman, and that kills my whole day. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, you know how that can be. Yes. Um, first of all, real quick, how are you doing? Do you ever get down to CR anymore? Do you have time? No. Uh, first of all, they wouldn't let people from Florida in uh, at all. I was afraid of that. Yeah. yeah. So, And now you can go, but you have to have a... COVID test, uh, no yeah. older than 48 hours, and you have to have international travel insurance in case you're hospitalized there because they, oh they, have, well, they have socialized medicine and they're not paying for us. So Right. Yeah. Nor should they, probably. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So there you have well, it. Well, sorry, to, I don't want to waste your time here. I'm going to try to go fast. Did you by any chance catch the article yesterday in the New York Times by, uh, what's his name, Thomas Edsall, the... Uh, the resentment that never sleeps. <laughs> no. Did you ever, did you catch that? No, I missed it. Oh my god! Oh my god! Try to catch it if you can. The resentment that never. It explains why so many people. Uh, let Let's start with extremely poor people, disenfranchised. You know, people out of the loop, no opportunities. Why so many go to the far far left, and others go to the far far right? Let's stick with the right. They are feeling so out of everything. They, they are being displaced, and they know it's true. It's coming with the Latino demographics changing, with black people rising. They are hysterical. The, the, the studies coming out of Denmark now, primarily, are showing with real clarity for the first time that people are not afraid of losing income or their jobs to these people that they're so afraid of. They're afraid of losing social status, and they see themselves being displaced, and they are getting hysterical. Now, this includes the upper echelons of the GOP. They're not as whack crazy as I sort of thought they might be. Well, this is and what I've been telling my audience, okay? This is what I've been saying on the air, and I know you say you haven't been listening for a while, hit, but... Hit me, hit me, hit me, I'm hit saying me. the same thing, that, you know, a lot of people want to just say, F them, and they're crazy, and they're... Yeah. 
and I'm saying to them, you have to understand how desperate they are to they are. to in order to be this way, in order to hate their own country in this, you know, right. with such ferociousness. You know, in order I don't know that they hate their own country. Oh, they they're do. just so afraid. No, they they hate their country. They hate the fact that uh, you know they hate us. They they just hate government. Uh, the government has yeah. been an extreme disappointment to them, and. Quite frankly, the government has been controlled by one man, Mitch McConnell, believe it or not. Yeah, boy, since, that's the since truth. 2009. And I'm trying God, to. God, I hate that man. I oh, my God. That and, I, and I'm telling you right now that the, the reason he holds up the stimulus package and the reason he's yeah. letting them starve in the middle of a pandemic is because they, he wants to pile on to this resentment. He wants to. He yes. wants them to hate even more yes. their own manner of governance. Now he That's is right. he is the impediment to progress. He is the impediment he to is the devil a, incarnate. No, I'm, I'm serious. You. Listen to me. He's the impediment to I the know. stimulus package. He's the impediment. They will end up defunding the police. The Republicans will. That's because right. They won't give the states and the cities money. And, and exactly. Not, and They're not, not going to bail the states out. It's not a bailout. Those states have to balance their budgets, and they take in more from the federal government than they pay in. Okay. Two dollars and forty-one cents, these, Kentucky, for every dollar. These red states are on permanent government welfare. Okay. That's right. And when the That's government right. refuses to give them their welfare check. Okay, yep. the state has to defund sanitation workers, police officers, public hospitals. They'll cut everything. Right. Yeah. And that will create even more hatred and resentment. And they think it it it, it ameliorates. They will make it sound as though we are the problem. Yes. Yes. They're so good at it. Their messaging is so damn brilliant. Ours is so rotten. You know. Ours isn't rotten. Ours isn't rotten. It's just that they don't hear us. They're not watching us. They're not listening to us. They're, they don't. People who I think they're people better than who we are, need but... people who need the most help are not watching this. They are not listening no, to not. this. Some of them no. don't even have internet. Some of them don't have broadband. I mean, no. so they're no. in, they're in a bubble. They're in a, a a bubble with peer pressure everywhere. Everywhere. There's no reason you would you would you would remember, but I go back to Kentucky twice a year for a month each, and I'm telling you, the last time I was back there, the hate against people like us is absolutely visceral. I know you can feel it in the air. I know they look at you like they want to kill you. I know, I know, and it's it's so it's so bizarre because Ooh. we're the people who are advocating for them to be I know it. to be remembered to be remembered. I know it. And, uh, you know, the others are just playing into their resentment. So there's really this is what I've been trying to explain to people who just want to, you know, disavow this 35 percent. I understand. I really do. But if we helped them, if we literally helped them and they could see a difference in their lives, a real difference in their lives with a Biden presidency and a Democratic Senate and House, we could end it, or at least ameliorate it, at least, at least tamp it down, this hatred. Mary, how does the book have to have to have to fall? We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's hey! a segment of your imagination. Randy Road Show. Turn up your mind. This morning, we learned another 853,000 Americans filed new jobless claims last week. That is about the same as the entire population of the state of North Dakota. That's a 137,000 jump from the week before. We've also got a jump in the number of people continuing to collect benefits here, too. The economic recovery appears to be slowing. Meanwhile, we're still hearing about the possibility of a stimulus package. And the clock is ticking. The House passed a short-term spending bill to avert a government shutdown and buy them more time to negotiate a stimulus bill. There are now three competing proposals and just nine days to get something done. Meanwhile, we're seeing more scenes like this, a seemingly endless line of cars at a holiday food giveaway. This economic pain is for many the result of the health crisis that has killed more than 289,000 Americans and left millions without work. Our President Trump 
isn't talking about stimulus talks or even the raging pandemic. Instead, President Trump meeting with state attorneys general today after several GOP states joined a last ditch legal effort to overturn President elect Biden's victory. The president and his supporters continue to make false claims of widespread fraud. Keep score, everybody. Keep score. I want you to keep score of who is an impediment to progress on any level, on any issue, on anything that you care about. Because frankly, uh, the idea that we have a chance to put the Senate into Democratic hands on January 5th by Georgia's voters should not be overlooked or dismissed or under supported. Because if we end up with Mitch McConnell as the majority leader yet again, then you will not see a meaningful stimulus package go to the people who need it the most. And I'm telling you that the resentment that that we were just talking about, uh, you know, I I believe that uh, article, it's an opinion piece by Thomas Edsel. It was in Wednesday's homework. So if you want to go to randyroads.com, click on homework, click on Wednesday's homework, it's in there. But honestly, the, the idea that they keep on adding and adding and adding resentment to people's minds with regard to the way that they are governed is everything they want to do because they want to overturn the way we govern ourselves. And building resentment in people by depriving them of freedom I mean, real freedom. You know, go look at FDR. You know, FDR had the four freedoms, and it was freedom of hunger, right? Freedom from hunger, freedom from want. That's what makes people free. And other countries in the world understand that. In Europe, in Canada, all over the the, the globe, when people were asked to stay home, to prevent the spread of COVID, Australia too, okay? And Australia, they're partying now. They're, they have concerts. They have, you know, outdoor events. They have, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, indoor restaurants. Uh, Australia's doing great. But when they were asking their people to stay home and actually asking their people not to travel from one province to another, or in our case, from, from state to state, in order to beat back COVID, they paid them. They paid them. Everything that they put in place in March and April was beefed up. It didn't have a a sunset on it like ours did, okay? Our our relief package ended. It ended. And people are tapped out. And the economy cannot recover unless we get rid of COVID. And it ain't going to happen so fast. I mean, Redfield was on the TV yesterday, and I don't know, you know, hardly anybody, uh, you know, uh, uh, played what he said, but what he said was really sad. It was depressing, but it's true. Probably for the next 60 to 90 days, we're going to have more deaths per day than we had in 9-11 or we had in Pearl Harbor. And the reality is the vaccine approval this week is not going to really impact that. It's not going to impact that. You know Why? We only have 20 million people that are able to get vaccinated by the end of this year. That's all we have. And that's not enough. We have more healthcare workers than that. We have more seniors than that. I mean, you know, and, and when you look at the kind of casualty, mass casualty incidents, uh, you know, uh, in this country that we've, you know, endured through, mass casualty events, we have surpassed the numbers, surpassed. More people died yesterday of COVID then died at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. That died on September 11th. That died in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Died at Gettysburg. Oh God. I mean, Willie, the, the, the numbers are staggering. And again, what happened on September 11th affected the way we looked at the world and conducted foreign policy and are still conducting foreign policy because of those deaths on one day. We've been talking about World War II, the Civil War. Um, More people have died uh, uh, from COVID (laughs) than died in combat deaths in World War I, World War II, or the Civil War. Jesus. It is just, it is, it is unbelievable that this president still 
uh, is not able to focus on this and that uh, leaders of his personality cult still don't take it as the public health threat that it is. It's a mass casualty event right up there with Pearl Harbor, right up there with 9-11, right up there with the Battle of Gettysburg. These, these are mass casualty events, okay? That is what this is. And Mitch McConnell is saying he doesn't see a path to an agreement for a stimulus package. He doesn't see a pathway forward. And so here again you have the Republicans wrecking this deal, wrecking this deal in the middle of a mass casualty event. The President of the United States of America is throwing paper towels at you in the middle of a mass casualty event as he is wont to do as he did in Puerto Rico. And you were cool with it because they were Puerto Ricans. They're not real Americans, they're Puerto Ricans. But when you look the other way, when he throws paper towels at Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, and you say nothing, then there's no one to say anything for you when he throws paper towels at you. And that is what they're offering you. In the middle of this, I mean, some governors have sent, you know, cloth masks through the mail, okay? And it's a paper towel. That is what they're offering you. I'm telling you, we law, you know, I I said this yesterday. Let me reiterate this over and over again. In the middle of the 2008 depression that was caused by the Republicans' deregulation, the party of let the banks do whatever they want to you, okay? It crashed our economy, and we were hemorrhaging 800,000 jobs a month every month. This month, we lost 853,000 jobs, 853,000 jobs, and it isn't even close to being over. We are in the middle of a mass casualty event. The president of the United States wants to talk about himself, and you have these these loyalists that only uh you know they're so afraid of trump supporters disinformation and misinformation and the sources of their misinformation and disinformation being held to no journalistic standards that we can find whatsoever and instead of doing something about propaganda in this country or doing something in this country about if you're going to brand yourself news then you need to meet basic minimum journalistic standards you need to fact check yourself you need to have an ombudsman you need to be able to prove what you're saying is true over and over and over and over again right instead you have people like over at fox news that argue in court that no reasonable person would believe anything that Tucker Carlson says. And that is their defense. That is their defense. No reasonable person would believe any of the fantasy that's spewed on Fox News. Therefore, they're innocent. It's your, it's buyer beware. You know, we could do something about this. We could totally fix this. Things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Dr. Kizmekia Corbett or Kizzy Corbett. Kizzy is an African American scientist who is right at the forefront of the development of the vaccine. So the first thing you might want to say to my African American brothers and sisters is that the vaccine that you're going to be taking and was developed by an African-American woman. And that is just a fact. I mean, that is a fact. And I think that's some of the things that people don't fully appreciate. So why would Dr. Fauci have to put out an announcement that uh, Kizmekia Corbett, who was responsible for identifying uh, the strand in the RNA that could build a protein, right, that could produce a reaction, uh, an antibody uh, reaction to this virus is an African-American scientist. Why? Because people do not trust their own government at this point. People don't trust our government. And that goes on both sides of the aisle. And you know what? If we don't restore 
some sort of normalcy in our governance. And none of it is normal that's going on now. Nothing is normal. We're in the middle of a mass casualty event. You have the President of the United States threatening Stephen Hahn, Dr. Hahn, uh, the head of the FDA today, telling him he needs to resign this afternoon unless he uh, approves this vaccine under political pressure, right? Which is increasing people's skepticism about putting this thing in their arm to the point where Fauci has to go on television and say to African-Americans who have every reason to be skeptical of their government uh, that the scientists at the National Institutes of Health who worked on this vaccine is an African-American scientist. Her name is Dr. Kizmekia Corbett. They call her Kizzy. Uh, This is her. What we know is that this virus is in the same family of viruses like SARS. So it is akin and about 80% genetically similar to the SARS virus. Um, We know now, um, based on some of the transmission data from China, that the not only did the virus jump from an animal reservoir into humans, but there is sustained human to human transmission. And that's been documented several times over now, um, including in a hospital setting with healthcare workers. Every day we're learning more and more and more. Um, Obviously because this is a novel virus and even though we've been to this rodeo before with MERS and SARS, there's still so many unknowns. What a, a mRNA vaccine is, is we're essentially delivering the genetic material. So we're delivering the messenger RNA that encodes our mutated novel coronavirus spike. The messenger RNA will tell the body to present this spike protein and the body will respond by creating an immune response. And hypothetically, if all goes well, then that immune response will then be able to see a novel coronavirus before a person gets infected and prevent that infection. That's Kismekia Corbett from the National Institutes of Health. And it's so sad that we have to actually look at the brilliant woman that we just heard and make a note that she's African-American so that African-Americans could have some confidence in the vaccine because this government has been so disappointing for so long to so many black and poor white and Hispanic and you name it. And it's because it's been in the hands of the Republican Party, which doesn't even exist anymore. It's now the party of Trumpism which is a racist, I mean, double down. They want another civil war. They literally want another Antietam. They literally want another Gettysburg. They want another civil war. They're interested in it. They think a do-over is what's needed. And they're all about Trump because Trump might bring it about. Well, that's just sick and sad. We have enough death in this country to go around. And by the way, you know what the Attorney General of the United States is doing today? They're trying to get more methods of execution, I swear to God. You know, this is a little factoid for you. No lame duck presidency has ever moved ahead with the execution of Americans during the lame duck period. It just, it doesn't happen. We've been killing people, we've been executing people on death row like a freaking conveyor belt, like the uh, the Lucy Candy Factory episode. And Bill Barr wants more methods other than lethal injection to be deployed in the killing of people on death row during a lame duck period. I mean, did they did they sit in a circle with tissues in the middle watching snuff films? I mean, is there like some sexual fabulousness that they uh, feel when they watch death? They love death, they worship death, they, they're totally into death. And they're talking their supporters into believing that killing and death and the death of democracy is good for them. It isn't good for you. It's death. It's death. Now, it's 426 in the afternoon Eastern time on a Friday, and I am waiting for the Supreme Court to give their 
one line opinion about go jump in the river with this, uh, you know, Greg Abbott, Texas, seditious, you know, uh, conspiracy that he's got going on there with all these uh, freaking Trump supporters. And my best guess is if they're going to do it today, and it's just a guess, but my best guess is if they're going to do it today, they'll do it like a minute before five o'clock. Omar in Virginia. Randy, thank you so much for taking my call. Um, you know, there's one cure that can solve a lot of problems, and that's removing Mitch McConnell. Uh, so so the DNC need to, like, throw whatever they got in, into Georgia. I mean, I think every Obama needs to go down there. Bernie Sanders needs to go. Everybody needs to go to Georgia. They will. They will. They definitely yeah. will. There's no question they're go, they're, they'll go to Georgia. I mean— Trump's going to go back to Georgia. There's no, there's no question he's going to go to Georgia again because, you know, Mitch McConnell's going to mm-hmm. make him go to Georgia uh, because Mitch McConnell is only interested in one thing, and that's Mitch McConnell yep. and, he's, and, and power, period. Yep. End of story. Yep. So, yep. But, yeah, absolutely. But real quick, regarding the Attorney General of Texas, um, one, I mean, can he be impeached? I mean, does the Texas State House anything i mean they're republican the whole legislature is they're they're never going to impeach you know the idea that you have an attorney general who's been under indictment for five years who we know defunded his own prosecution whose wife is a a sitting senator who introduced legislation that would make the thing he's under indictment for legal i mean it's such a corrupt place this is so unbelievable and they keep on voting against their own best interests which is law and order you know they yeah, they, they yeah. spew this at me and, and, and i, I sit here think, with my big brain knowing how corrupt they are yeah yeah and i really think that they engage in a lot of our oppression because all the polls prior to the election showed texas blue well there was a lot of voter suppression and you know how you know when you see 10 hour lines or one drop box for over a million people, that's how you know. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561 270 3844. 561 270 3844. The president is trying to overturn the election he lost. He did it out loud at a vaccine event yesterday, which gives you a sense of his priorities. We won in those swing states. But he appears to have lost one potential ally that he was counting on. The United States Supreme Court spent a hot minute looking at a Trump case to try to throw out the election results in Pennsylvania, and then just said no unanimously in a one sentence order. They were not taking this thing up. The Supreme Court now has a six to three conservative majority. And all six conservatives said no way, including three justices who Trump himself appointed. So that's a pretty harsh rebuke. Now we will watch this other last second lawsuit from Republicans in Texas. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton filing a suit against four states, asking the Supreme Court to declare election certifications in Georgia. Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin unconstitutional. But so far, the Supreme Court has been very clear here. It does not want to get involved. I wonder how he's going to take it, you know, when they decide that they don't want to overturn the will of the people, you know, in a constitutional republic. They may not be willing to go that far for him. We'll see. Ed in the Bronx. Yes, hi, Randy. Um, love your show. I watch you every day. Thank you. Um, the, the question I have is, will anyone ever investigate how Mitch McConnell managed to win his seat again? Well, that's what I, I think with that... With an 18% uh, approval rating. Yeah, I mean, it, it, if, if they want to go play, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy games in the court... Uh, you're driving me crazy you're supposed to turn the volume down because it's a slight delay um so that if you would you know tell me i'm a f and whatever i could dump you so that's the reason to turn it down but that's what i was saying earlier why don't we counterclaim why don't we file a counterclaim why doesn't michigan dana nestle she's a great attorney general right why doesn't she file a counterclaim uh, with the supreme court and say you know if we're going to play this game where texas says they don't like the way michigan's uh, you know legislature chose the electors you know they didn't like the manner in which we selected which is popular vote uh then let's do a counterclaim and say 
Uh, we don't like the way Mitch McConnell was elected in Kentucky. We don't like the way Lindsey Graham was elected in South Carolina. In fact, we don't like a lot of the gerrymandering. We don't like the voter suppression we saw in Georgia. Because there were 11-hour lines in Georgia for early voting. Remember that? Does anybody remember that? 11 freaking hours. That right there, that's voter suppression. There is no reason in the 21st century, in the middle of a pandemic, no less, that anybody should be waiting 11 hours for anything, let alone to cast a ballot. So, yeah, you want to play these, uh, you know, these games? Let's play. That's what I said. Let's play. Patrick in L.A. Randy, hey, love your stuff as always. And, and you know, fantastic point there regarding, you know, how, how it is that Republicans are running elections, which goes to the point of what you were talking about earlier with the scientists, the black scientists. You know, the, um, um, you know, the point was that, you know, black people don't trust government. Well, we, everybody needs to be qualifying that it's not government, it's conservative government. Yes, it conservative is. Conservative government will always let you down. Conservative government will defund you, it will deregulate you, it will it will impoverish you, it will, um, you, you know, allow uh, uh, companies to run roughshod over you, to take your money, to poison you, to... Redistribute um, your taxpayer dollars, not to your community, mm-hmm. but to the wealthy, over and over and over and over. Deregulate big Kentucky. business and regulate you out of business. Uh, they are the Confederacy. They've never stopped being the Confederacy. That is who they are. They they learned all this stuff with jelly beans and 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 putting barriers up to vote and you know uh, white only and black only. You know they, they've never changed. Not once have they ever even tried tried well, to understand at least, at least, at least since, since since the civil war and, and after that they abandoned they abandoned their efforts to to have anything to do with black right right yeah you know they, they've abandoned it since then and um but but i mean all your listeners need to need to respond it's not government it's conservative government. Here, here's the message okay this is really the yep. message I, this is what i say to uh poor whites or to people who are losing their businesses because of this pandemic or people who are just uh living in rust belt towns that never ever redeveloped okay didn't reconstruct when industry changed, okay, which is what Biden is talking about, reconstruction, right? He's talking about building broadband for people who don't have it, and believe it or not, in this country, too many don't have it. He's also talking about, you know, setting up uh, uh, green energy uh, industries in Rust Belt towns to bring back really good paying jobs, okay? These people will be there to defund infrastructure investment. They exist to do that. They exist to be a barrier between the, the, the poor whites in this country who need reconstruction and blacks in this country who need reconstruction and never got it. And here is the conclusion. We are all black now. Precisely. Precisely. Yeah, we, um, we, we uh, it, and, and, and blacks have felt the majority of this. But in the end, but in the, the grace, end. the grace in which they carry their burden is 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 something to be admired, and 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 we need to actually develop grace and say, oh my God, you know, enough of this. Let's move forward. Let's have some progress here. The Republicans have had control over our lives for almost twenty years now. It has to end. Let's try a different way. Let's try. And and additionally, though, you know, the our, our, our representatives need to be responding in a in. in That's what in, I'm saying. You know, Ever since Newt Gingrich and the freaking ridiculous Republican Revolution, everybody has suffered. Everybody who is not uber rich or very well connected to government or can afford a lobbyist, we've all been screwed. They have come and they have tried to dismantle our collective bargaining agreements. They have tried to, you know, disenfranchise us. They have gerrymandered us into insignificance in our own backyards. You want freedom? I'm promising you maximum freedom. Maximum. But that only comes with economic freedom. That only comes with freedom from disease. That only comes with freedom to actually be able to make a living in this world. 
And as long as you keep voting for the people that are watching those factories sit there boarded up year after year after year after year after year after year after year, year doing nothing, building nothing, creating nothing in southern Ohio, in northern Kentucky, in central uh, Illinois, nothing. All Donald Trump did was lie. Oh, they're bringing the factories, you know, they closed Lordstown. You know, I mean, try a new way. Try the maximum freedom way. Try the way that actually invests in you, that puts money in your pocket, that puts money into your small business, that creates a tax regime that actually celebrates. They talk about freedom to try. Celebrate the freedom to try. Celebrate the freedom to open up a business. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. I don't usually have to fact check court briefs. They may make dubious legal arguments, but they don't usually just make up a bunch of facts. This Trump brief does that. It's filled with total nonsense. It's kind of like a lawyer took Trump's Twitter feed and polished it up into legal language. So let me go through some of the claims in this brief. Number one, the brief notes that Trump won both Florida and Ohio. True, sure. And then it says no candidate in history, Republican or Democrat, has ever lost the election after winning both states. That's just wrong. Richard Nixon won Florida and Ohio in 1960, but lost the election to Kennedy. Also, even if that claim was right, Who cares? That would be an interesting fact, not evidence of fraud in 2020. Number two, Brooke, the brief claims that in Wisconsin, all of the largest cities used unsecured absentee ballot drop boxes. Nope. Again, that's totally wrong. They were not unsecured. They were bolted to the ground. They were built with durable materials. They were designed to be tamper proof. And many of them, including in big cities, Milwaukee and Green Bay, were monitored 24 hours a day with video surveillance. Number three, the brief also generally claims that leaving ballot boxes in parking lots invites fraud. We'll talk to election experts (laughs) around the country. They'll tell you there is no evidence of any significant fraud involving these drop boxes in parking lots outside Wisconsin as well. They're secured in various ways, bolted, video videotape, tamper-proof, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and drop boxes have been used for years. Number oh. four, the brief invokes a statement uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo made about the election in Belarus. Belarus. Pompeo right. said the prohibition of local independent observers at polling stations is one reason the Belarus election wasn't free and fair. Right. Well, yes, that was a bad <laughs> election, but that statement doesn't have any relevance to this United States election. Really? There's no evidence independent observers here were banned. Trump claim after claim about Republican poll watchers being banned has been debunked. Number right. f- five... <laughs> Five, Do you need to take going. a breath? You need to take a sip of water, okay, Daniel? Okay. You good? I've, I've breathed. You good? Okay, we got a okay. few more. Number five. Okay. Number five. The brief alleged that Pennsylvania's Secretary of State was in, it said, direct violation of state law by issuing guidance telling counties not to try to match signatures from absentee voters to signatures on file. Look, the Supreme Court, not me, is the boss of what's legal and not, but the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled seven to zero that nothing in state law requires the signature matching, and a Trump appointed federal judge ruled exactly the same thing. Number six, the brief alleged that Michigan's Secretary of State broke the law by sending an absentee ballot application to all registered voters there. Again, I'm not in charge of deciding what's legal and not, but there's really no apparent basis for this claim. Absentee ballot application forms are available online. Anyone in Michigan, a nonprofit, a campaign, Joe Schmo, can print them off and mail them to people. Trump was actually asked in May what he thinks is illegal about what Michigan did. He wouldn't offer a specific answer. And finally, Brooke, I promise I'm almost done. Number seven, the brief pointed... Thank you, thank you. The brief pointedly (laughs) notes that Trump won 18 of 19 so-called bellwether counties identified by the Wall Street Journal, places that voted for the presidential winner in every election from 1980 through 2016. Well, the verdict on this one is true. But again, who cares? As demographic change, as politics change, preferences change, bellwether counties can cease to be bellwethers for all sorts of entirely boring reasons. So this data point is an interesting thing for pundits to talk about, but it doesn't say anything about whether this election was free and fair. And Brooke, as we know, this election was indeed free and fair. Do you want to say that again, Daniel? I don't. I'm done. (laughs) <laughs> Daniel Dale. He's amazing. Uh, but every point in the legal brief to the Supreme Court was false. 
every single one, except for the 18 and the 19 bellwether counties. Every single thing was a lie. And the idea that people believe these lies should not be lost on anybody in this audience because what we have here is a propaganda machine that churns out so much misinformation, disinformation, outright lies and falsehoods that America is literally being bamboozled into believing that they must overthrow their own government. That is the message. That is what is so crazy and creepy and seditious and ugly about this presidency and the people that support it. The elected officials who took an oath to uphold and protect and defend the Constitution who refused to do so, they need to be sanctioned. They need to not be seated in the 117th Congress, especially if they think that the election in which they just won was a fraudulent election. How could they possibly take their seat? How? The most important thing that everybody in this country needs to hear, should be hearing, should be understanding, should be working towards together is the freedom, a re, a, a, an agenda of maximum, maximum freedom. That can only be achieved through economic freedom. That can only be achieved with freedom from want. And what does that mean? That means that every American should have adequate health care, should have food, should have clothing, should have housing and medical care and social services when they need them, the right to not be afraid of disease, the right to not be afraid of unemployment and disability and old age. And until and unless we actually get our brains wrapped around that fact, the resentment in this country is going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until people believe what autocrats across the world believe, that democracy doesn't work. It does, but not with this party. This party is corrupt to the core. It is self-dealing. It is self-serving. It gerrymanders to keep power. It suppresses voters to keep power. It does every single thing you could think of to keep power. And that is anathema to the American way of life. It's actually poison. It's poisonous. You know, I, I put something in the homework today. It's an opinion piece, but it's so well done. It's by Dana Milbank. Okay, and Dana Milbank, uh, you know, decided to write Donald Trump's farewell address based on Donald Trump's own tweets. I'll, I'll tweet it out so that you can read it, but, uh, so that you know which one it is. But honest, it's hysterical, but it's sad. It's really sad because if you just put Donald Trump's tweets down on paper over the last few days and let it suffice as his farewell address, the last thing he will be saying, kicking and screaming, the brat that he is, the autocrat that he is, the demagogue that he is, is it was rigged, it was unfair, it was it. While we're absorbing 3,300 deaths a day every day in this country, while we're seeing 200,000 new cases a day every day in this country, while over 107,000 people are in the hospital literally suffering, if not dying, from a mass casualty event that he refused and refuses still to this minute to address. It's really sad. We should never have gotten this far, but you know what? We did, and you should learn from it. It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't. We don't need to have a rust belt in this country. Uh, Stephen, Arizona. Hey, Randy, uh, I, I want to talk about an intervention, but I agree with you 100%. Um, these 120-something Congress people or House representatives should not be seated. No 126 way. of them now. That's yeah. 64% this, this, of all serving Republicans. It is outrageous. It is. You know, um, if, i got to ask you this question. You know, let's say you have an employee and you hired them, and they did absolutely nothing for 12 years. <laughs> What, what would you do with them? 
Right. I'm, I'm sure you'd get rid of them. And I submit to you, we have Mitch McConnell in Kentucky who has done absolutely nothing for our country. Twelve years he has not brought anything to the floor other than tax cuts for the wealthy and deregulation for business. And he has, he has done absolutely nothing. And I think he should be brought up on charges of sedition. And I don't care if there's some protection or not, supposed it's a protection or, or an opinion wrote like you can't prosecute a sitting president. That's an opinion, well, not a law. That, or that has nothing to do it. with a senator, number one. Number two, he hasn't committed a crime that I'm aware of. But the idea that this man is, is uh, sees no path to an agreement for stimulus in the middle of a mass casualty event uh, uh, on, uh, after the election and people... A record number of people are sitting in miles long lines for food and he won his election with 18% approval I don't know yeah I, I, I was really hoping Amy could take care of that I mean well, what we can do is make him a minority leader and defang him defang him like he's a snake he's the, that's the wrong reptile he's a he's a big old fat slow turtle is what he is. And you know what he's holding up, uh, you know, your stimulus money for, your unemployment benefits for, money for police officers in public hospitals, for liability protection for big business. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes Air Force. Air, Air, Air Force. RandyRhodes.com. Welcome to Code Whack. Your podcast on America's broken healthcare system and how Medicare for All could help. I'm your host, Brenda Gazar. What are the prospects for Medicare for All, for the country, and for state based efforts under a Biden presidency? Who better to ask than Michael Leidy, who's organized, advocated, and developed policy for single payer Medicare for All nationally and in California for nearly three decades? He's a founding fellow of the Sanders Institute, and most recently, he was the healthcare constituency director for Bernie 2020. Welcome to Code WAC, Michael. Oh, thank you, Brenda. It's great to be back. I wanted to ask you about Joe Biden. Um, what does Joe Biden's presidential election mean for the national Medicare for All movement? I guess I would be a little bit on the optimist side. I mean, he did kind of make a point, particularly in the last month of the election, saying he didn't support Medicare for all. So we can't be naive about where his uh, stance lies. But on the other hand, if you look at the pandemic, they want to do something immediately to give people health care. The Health Care Emergency Guarantee Act embodies key principles of Medicare for all, covering everybody, no out-of-pocket expenses, filling the gaps you know, where, where people are uninsured, like in Medicaid expansion. So I think in the context of that discussion, the Guarantee Act looks very attractive. Secondly, this is an administration that will feel compelled to allow states to set up single-payer systems through the provision of 1332 of the Affordable Care Act, which grants uh, the federal government the ability to provide waivers for states to, to do uh, universal health care. So robust applications like from California and New York for those waivers would very likely succeed. So a lot of the efforts go to the state level. And then finally, under the Unity Task Force that was established between the Sanders and, and Biden campaigns, they came up with a very robust version of a public option. It is put everyone who earns under 54000 into Medicare, focused on the states that, that didn't expand Medicaid. And you would do that on, again, a basis of no out-of-pocket expenses for those families of four. So you look at that terrain and you say, OK, we're not going to make a leap forward. I guess he's not prepared to sign, you know, H.R. 1384. But you do have openings that are consistent with a publicly administered, publicly financed system. And, of course, you have the agitational value of saying what you're going to do is leave 10 million people uncovered. You're going to spend all this money subsidizing the profits of a rapacious and uh, denial based 